Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Today's webinar is titled The Future of Personalized Orthopedics, Kinematic Modeling to Restore the Pre-Morbid Knee Functionality Through Robot-Assisted TKA. My name is Christopher Ivers, and I work here at Anybody Technology. And today I will be the host of this web webinar. In today's webinar, we have two external speakers, Danielle Di Masari, who works as a data science manager at Stryker, and Periklis Sanitis, a PhD candidate at the University of Twente in the Netherlands. And Danielle and Periklis will jointly talk about the challenge of defining the surgical target in robot-assisted TKA, and also discuss how 3D medical imaging combined with kinematic musculoskeletal model-based implant optimization could benefit the treatment planning for orthopedic patients. And this presentation will start in a few minutes or so, but just before we get started, I will just give you a general introduction and overview of the antibody modeling system. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the software or musculoskeletal modeling and simulations in general. First of all, I would like to point your attention to the control panel, which appears on the right side of your screen. You are very welcome to submit questions and comments via this question panel during the presentation, and we will try to address these questions in the very end of this webinar. In case we do not get to answer all of your questions, we will try to do so by email within a reasonable time. So, let's begin with having a look at what the Anybody Modeling System actually is. The Anybody Modeling System is a software that allows you to do musculoskeletal modeling and simulations. As input, it takes motion data as kinematics and forces, and it calculates the internal body loads as joint moments, joint reaction forces, and muscle forces. And down here in the bottom of the screen, you can see an actual screenshot from the software, so this can give you an idea of how the system actually looks. At the moment, anybody is used in a wide variety of areas and applications, and a few examples of this is movement analysis, product optimization design, the field of sports optimization, ergonomics, orthopedics and rehabilitation, and assistive devices, for example, an exoskeleton. And just to give you a, a general idea of the typical workflow in anybody, then it could look something like this. So you provide the recorded motion data as input, and then you can then you can use the body models which you or others have built. And then you can provide some kind of environment which could be a special type of equipment or, for example, an exoskeleton. Then you can use anybody to combine these things and then solve the muscle recruitment and run the inverse dynamic simulations. And this basically means that we go from motion to calculate the internal body loads and the interaction with the environment in some cases. And this basically gives you a simulation that looks something like this. We can then go ahead and output the results and use it for some kind of post-processing, which for example could be with a finite element tool. But many users also choose to close this loop completely by doing some kind of design optimization and then run this cycle multiple times. And this actually brings me to the end of the introduction, and I will hand over the word and present the road to Periklis instead. Great. Uh, so first of all, thank you, Christopher, for the invitation, and thank you all for attending this uh, session. It's a great pleasure to speak at the Anybody webcast series for, for a second time. Uh, please let me start with a brief introduction of myself and uh, background. My name is uh, Pericles Zenetis, and I'm a doctoral candidate in the orthopedic research group at the uh, biomechanical engineering department of the University of Twente in the Netherlands. My research lies in the field of orthopedic uh, biomechanics and focuses on 3D medical imaging and the musculoskeletal modeling of the lower extremity to personalize knee surgery and optimize functionality of the uh, implanted joint. Uh, since 2018, I'm also the leader of Biomedical Engineering Group 20, and uh, besides, I'm also a member of the European Society of Biomechanics and the International Society for Technology in Arthroplasty. Um, I suggest, Daniela, you take it over from here. Please uh, go ahead and uh, introduce yourself as well. Thanks, Pericles. Again, thanks. Uh, Christopher and anybody technology for inviting us here today. I'm really happy also to uh, co-presenting uh, with uh, Pericles. Um, yeah, a little bit about myself. You see here, I work at Stryker. I represent today here the uh, data science and computer vision team uh, focusing on clinical intelligence uh, and uh, clinical use cases. 
and we are part of a bigger organization with this striker, which is digital robotics and enabling uh, technologies. When it comes to focus areas, you will uh, um, understand uh, that uh, in the following uh, slide. Can, yeah, thanks. So why are these two organizations collaborating? Why did we come together for this specific uh, endeavor and initiative? And here you see basically the reason for that. We are putting on the table um, quite a, you know, a, a broad range of competencies that are complementary to each other. Of course, for no, uh, um, for any means, uh, we are here depicting the entire a landscape of competencies in the two organizations and just focusing on uh, um, what we are leveraging for this uh, um, for this uh, particular um, project and from striker side indeed uh, we are uh, um, using our deep anatomical modeling computer vision uh, expertise in the 3d medical imaging field that is then also uh, used in parallel with the robotic surgical um, expertise that is uh, um, also, uh, uh, you know, a, a, an input, the anatomical modeling and computer vision uh, skill set to uh, then uh, generate also surgical uh, planning. And um, on top of that, uh, we do have an extensive uh, clinical knowledge base that uh, is not only produced uh, in, internally, but is also uh, making use of the scientific disseminations in the scientific li literature where uh, you know peer-reviewed articles are uh, um, supporting the effectiveness of our devices from the university of twente side and specifically the orthopedic research group that parentheses belongs to um, we all know that they are pretty active in different fields specifically finite uh, element uh, uh, modeling where they investigate the uh, interaction between the bone and the implant, and specifically the micro movement, so they can characterize the uh, loading patterns. And then uh, also studies uh, um, where they focus on uh, musculoskeletal modeling, specifically on the lower extremities, and they work towards the optimization of the therapy for orthopedic patients. And then we have also, um, they have actually studied and combined statistical shape modeling with musculoskeletal simulations. In that case, to look at how different joint phenotypes do have an impact on surgical outcome. And uh, yeah, if we look at the overall uh, um, scene of the healthcare uh, uh, setting, uh, we are going through a digital transformation. Um, healthcare setting is probably lagging behind uh, some other fields where that has happened uh, or still ongoing but started uh, uh, maybe a decade ago. Healthcare is in the midst of that and you can read everywhere um, that there is a big need for, um, for, especially for the patient, to have a seamless experience navigating through the care continuum. So if for any specific reason, different healthcare providers are actually required to take action, we should be able to provide the patient with a unique view of, for instance, his own data, and not to have any friction when it comes to information flowing from one system to the other. So a keyword should be interoperability, a keyword should be patient experience, so then he can experience the best healthcare possible and hence leading ultimately to the best outcome possible. And we are doing that and we are helping indeed this transformation. We are embracing this transformation at Stryker. If you can move to the next slide, please. Um, where you see here um, the main three pillars where Stryker is active in the medtech arena, medical and surgical, neurotech and spine, and orthopedics. And today we're gonna uh, focus on uh, orthopedics. And uh, here you see, of course, it's not, it's not a comprehensive view of all the products we have, but that's just to depict you which are the main um, items in our product portfolio that are um, leveraged for um, making this digital transformation happening, uh, leveraging hardware, software, and uh, platform and services around those uh, to, um, as I said, ultimately 
helping uh, the patient having a better experience, our customers also to feel more, you know, effective and uh, ultimately also to uh, make healthcare better. Um, few, yeah, so when it comes to orthopedics, which is, uh, um, let's say, the main focus area of this topic, um, we, um, we have to mention indeed MECO, which is our flagship in the surgical arena. That's a, a device, so a robot that assists the surgeons during the um, during a three different indications, actually three different types of surgeries at the moment, total knee, partial knee, and uh, total hip uh, arthroplasty. Um, in case of the knee joint um, for total knee arthroplasty, which is the uh, um, focus area of Pericles work, um, basically the, the patient uh, is undergoing a, a surgery where the joint is replaced by a prosthesis, the partial knee, only one compartment of the joint, is uh, um, resurfaced and uh, uh, um, uh, substituted with the prosthesis. And the same applies to total knee arthroplasty, where the entire hip uh, joint is uh, uh, actually substituted by, um, by prosthesis. You see here how big and deep um, and wide, actually, uh, in this case, if we look at the geographical uh, reach, the, uh, the um, device and the installment base is, we are talking about more than 1,400 um, devices, so MECO uh, installed worldwide in more than 30 different countries, and to date, more than 600 procedures have been already uh, performed uh, where the surgeon was supported by uh, MECO. You see also like the patent por portfolio around that, and more than 300 peer-reviewed articles have been uh, written and disseminated uh, where the um, yeah, MECO in itself, but you know, the effectiveness of this device has been studied. Um, when it comes to uh, indeed the digital transformation we're talking about, uh, here we look at how we envision the digital joint replacement, replacement journey and how a patient is basically followed across the continuum step by step and at every at every step we see here in this infographic which striker products do play a role at that particular time so we start from preoperative intraoperative and postoperative for the preoperative uh, phase um, of course one of the key uh, moments is the pre uh, is the uh, personalized 3d planning that uh, is generated based on 3d medical images and uh, in the intraoperative phase, that's where, uh, um, you know, the robot MECO um, is uh, uh, used by the surgeon to uh, prepare the bone, so to uh, perform the bone cut, to balance the knee, and also some, uh, um, some sensors, sensor can also be leveraged in that case, and to finally uh, place the implant in the in the desired position in the 3D knee space. And then post-operatively, so after discharge, we can also follow and monitor and track the patient and track the uh, evolution or let's say the development of the uh, rehabilitation um, so that we can also um, you know, modify that regime, um, the exercises, for instance, or provide educational material to the patient according to what we can detect uh, by means of sensors or some other uh, digital, um, digital uh, um, solutions. And for today, we are going to focus on the pre-operative uh, um, space and in particular, the generation of uh, a personalized 3D planning. So if you look at uh, um, the normal, really high level, normal um, MECO workflow, Currently, nowadays, uh, once the patient, together with the surgeon, decided to undergo uh, total knee arthroplasty, so the patient is scheduled for a, for a surgery. Um, as I said before, we're going to only focus on total knee arthroplasty today. So a CT scan is uh, warranted, so is prescribed, is collected. So that means that based on a 3D image of the knee. Um, a model, so a new model is created and, um, and a plan is generated according to that so that the bony cut 
um, can be decided and the surgeon can um, define where the implant, both at the femur and, implant and, and tibial level, will be placed. So in the 3D, uh, in the 3D space. And um, so that once, the, um, once the, the plan is generated, that can be transferred to, um, to, the, to the robot and the day of the surgery, the total neotoplasty surgery can be conducted and MECO will help the surgeon or will drive the surgeon into placing precisely the implant where that has been decided. And on top of that, as we said, also to help the balancing, the dynamic balancing of the knee during, uh, during the surgery. And um, yeah, I will give the floor to Pericles, who will uh, actually talk about uh, um, more in depth how a patient and why a patient is uh, uh, actually prescribed for a total knee uh, arthroplasty, all the way to how he um, is tackling and introducing yet another variable into uh, the surgical plan generation, looking at the biomechanics uh, uh, patterns, all the way to how to include that into the current workflow. So, Pericles, the floor is yeah. yours. Thanks, uh, Daniela. Uh, so, to follow up and uh, taking a step uh, back, uh, the most common reason for a total knee osteoplasty is uh, knee osteoarthritis. And uh, osteoarthritis may cause pain, and that is actually the predominant symptom for a patient to visit a doctor. Stiffness, which typically resolves in uh, minutes, as well as loss of function and limited range of motion while performing uh, activities of daily living. Osteoarthritis is, is a progressive joint disease, and it is associated with degradation of articular cartilage. So the cartilage wears away, and uh, morphological changes too in, uh, in the subchondral bone. This X-ray uh, depicts the most common radiographic findings of neosteoarthritis, including the formation of osteophytes, an arrow joint space, subchondral sclerosis, and cyst formation. And um, here, we actually investigate only one aspect of the disease, that is the formation of uh, osteophytes. Um, osteophyte formation is in addition to joint space narrowing, subchondral sclerosis, and cyst formation, one of the main radiographic features of osteoarthritis. And it is also an important criterion to assess the development and progression of the disease. Let's look at this radiograph here. Um, from left to right, what we see is uh, a healthy knee with smooth bones. And next to that, a knee with osteoarthritis, which progresses very heavily. And this may end up in a severely diseased joint, as we see in picture C, with large anterior femoral and posterior condylar osteophytes, also osteophytes posteriorly to the tibial plateau and a narrow joint space. So you can imagine that this condition may impose restrictions to the uh, joint's functionality and the range of motion. This pathological condition can be treated with total knee arthroplasty, as Daniela mentioned earlier. And in total knee arthroplasty, the, the diseased bones are replaced with artificial components, including a femoral component, a tibial tray, and a polyethylene insert, as well as a patellar baton, uh, depending, however, on the condition of the underside of the patella. So this is not always the case. Um, in general, total knee arthroplasty is, is complex, it's a complex process. And it is important to mention that there is no single recipe to follow for all the patients. There are different approaches, different alignment techniques that have been developed and proposed in the course of the years, but there is no consensus in the orthopedic community which works best for each individual patient. But over the years, technology has progressed from the minor intervention to the use of personalized surgical tools, uh, knee navigation all the way to robotics. And on that, a robotic assisted total neoplasty has been uh, shown to be highly precise in the preoperatively planned bone resections and also when positioning the prosthetic components. Uh, the question, however, here becomes what is the target of these uh, instruments that will subsequently lead to clinical improvement? So, do we, for example, define the pre morbid geometry? and uh, restoration of the pre-morbid kinematics as a target? Well, to investigate this question, we have developed uh, this workflow, which combines 3D medical imaging with musculoskeletal modeling 
and uh, model-based optimization, ultimately aiming to formulate a personalized pre-operative plan that will assist the surgeon before going to the operating room or executing the robotic uh, surgical plan. And as we see here in this workflow, we start the process with a pre-operative CT scan of the patient's knee. Subsequently, we do image segmentation, and we do this using a statistical shape model that is trained to identify the arthritic bone surface that includes osteophytes. And keep in mind that osteophytes are typically visible along the peripheral edges of the knee joint and indicated here with a yellow line. And it is also trained to identify features of the subchondral bone below the osteophytes and distinguish between the osteophytic bone. And in this way, we can uh, generate the pre-morbid bone geometry, as we see on the right of this uh, slide. So to move on, these uh, bone geometries are used as an input for scaling a musculoskeletal knee model, as shown here. And a few words about this model. Um, this is a knee-only model, and uh, we have developed this using a previously well-established uh, methodology. In, uh, in terms of its structure, it comprises the distal femur, the proximal shank, and the patella. And about the soft tissues, as you see, it includes the quadriceps, as we uh, kindly simulate only knee extension movement, and the ligaments, which are modeled as nonlinear elastic spring elements with some stiffness and reference strength. And this uh, information were actually retrieved from uh, literature data. Now, using this model, we are able to incorporate both the arthritic and pre-morbid geometries that we showed earlier, and we can simulate these two configurations for each individual patient. So we can determine whether there is any difference in the kinematics, such as the example case here in the anterior-posterior translation and the ligament strains. And I'm happy to present you today our uh, preliminary results from uh, our first 15 uh, patients. And starting with uh, the kinematics in general, we observed larger differences in kinematics between arthritic and pre-morbid knees with larger osteophytic volumes, but this is not always the case. Uh, we believe and we, uh, we see that this depends on the osteophytic compartment and to the extent that the osteophytes injure with the kinematics and the relevant ligamentous structures. What is worth noting here is that the reported differences are larger than the accuracy obtained in robotic assisted total neoarthroplasty, and that is lower than uh, one millimeter on one degree. So these differences here are uh, relevant. Similarly, uh, in terms of, um, of ligament strains, um, we observed increased strain deviations uh, with larger osteophytic volumes, always in relation to the osteophytic uh, compartment. And uh, this is an example case of a patient with large posterior condylar osteophytes and uh, also tibial posterolateral osteophytes, which increase considerably the strength of the uh, oblique popliteal ligament and the posterior capture. Um, so these ligaments, as you see here, they are located uh, on the posterior aspect of, of the knee. And this happens because the ligaments, the particular ligaments, have to wrap around the, the osteophytic bone and consequently they stretch too much. Uh, soon a publication will be out on this study describing extensively our methodology and uh, presenting our analysis on how uh, the presence of osteophytes, in particular femoral and tibial compartments, may affect the behavior of the ligaments and subsequently the knee kinematics. So to, book, to, to go back to our findings, uh, we believe that reconstructing the pre-morbid geometry would be uh, beneficial for an accurate uh, pre-operative planning. And for instance, in, in selection of the, the optimal uh, size of the implant and also uh, positioning of the, of the implant. And about the latter, and as previously mentioned, there are different alignment techniques and philosophies about the position of the implant. And in the past, mechanical alignment was the gold standard. Uh, mechanical alignment simply aims at the straight leg. And the rationale behind that concept was to achieve a symmetrical loading on the tibial insert, and uh, thus increase the longevity of the implant. Nevertheless, with new materials and sterilization methods, we can uh, actually loosen the boundaries of symmetrical loading. 
And apart from a mechanical alignment, kinematic alignment and functional alignment have also been proposed to restore the native knee and um, also achieve soft tissue balance. But the question here is, do these philosophies define the final target and do we get everything out of these uh, versatile tools? Uh, well, we believe that there is still room for improvement and further personalization. So to move on to our workflow, we have used our model and we have mechanically implanted the model. Um, so we designed an optimization scheme which actually varies the position of the implant with respect to mechanical alignment. That is our starting point uh, right now. And we aim to find the position that reproduces as closely as possible the pre-morbid kinematics. And um, hereby, an example from a single patient showing the anterior posterior translation of the pre-morbid model with a gray dotted line, the mechanical aligned model with red, and the optimally aligned model with blue. And this is actually a safe driven um, alignment that respects as much as possible the pre-morbid uh, kinematics over the full range of, of motion. And uh, if you would like to know more about our optimization strategy, uh, please see our abstract from the International Society for Technology and Arthroplasty Congress 2022 in Maui, uh, Hawaii. So, Daniela, getting back to you, what we have achieved so far. Cool, thanks, Pericles. So, so what you, you have learned today, indeed, uh, uh, as I depicted at the beginning, uh, if you can switch the next one, please, Pericles. Um, it's the current, you know, workflow. Indeed, uh, we start from a, a CT scan, a 3D image of the knee. A personalized 3D anatomical base plan is generated that is used uh, intraoperatively by the machine, by Meko and uh, um, and the surgeon uh, leading the, the the surgery, of course, uh, to precisely place the implant and also to balance the knee. But Pericles has suggested and has worked on is a, an augmentation of that uh, uh, plan generation process, where actually we are also looking at the um, image to extract uh, the pre-morbid bone surface. So basically the surface of the, mode, of the bone, um, a prediction of that, an estimation of that, how that would have looked like before the onset of the disease, use that uh, to uh, run a simulation, a musculoskeletal model simulation, to derive the kinematics of the premorbid knee, and to use that to um, actually dynamically um, optimi optimize the uh, position of the, of the implant so that we could recreate, we could mimic the kinematic patterns as um, done during the previous uh, step, meaning to mimic the pre-morbid uh, kinematic uh, patterns. And that plan, meaning the position of, uh, of, the, um, of the implant that optimizes that, so that generates a kinematic um, signature as close as possible as the pre-morbid signature, is then used intraoperatively again for uh, performing the total knee arthroplasty surgery. So I hope uh, that uh, uh, gave you, uh, you know, um, uh, a nice picture of uh, uh, the collaboration, the ongoing collaboration between the University of Twente and, and Stryker. More to come, uh, the results presented by Pericles uh, um, are not yet final, so more to be, um, to be seen and read. Uh, Pericles is uh, working uh, on, uh, uh, you know, even further uh, publications. So we are looking forward also to see the final result uh, uh, myself. And with that, yeah, that's uh, all uh, for today from us. And um, yeah, I'll give back to Christopher. Thank you very much for the presentation to both of you. I'll just make myself the presenter once again. So just before we go to the Q&A session, I would just like to say a few words about our online resources and also an upcoming webcast we have. So if you want to know more about anybody technology, 
then you can go and check out our website, anybodytech.com, where you can find different events, special dates, previous webcasts, and it's also here we have a full publication list of studies using the Anybody modeling system. So you can go and check that out and get some inspiration for, for the areas you work in. We also have a community website called anyscript.org, which is our website for people using anybody. And here you'll find multiple online resources as our wiki page, several blog posts, and also links to our repository sites. It's also here our forum is located, so you can go and ask questions and get some help from some fellow anybody users. Then I would like to announce our upcoming webcast on November 28th. The title of this webcast is Biomechanical Evaluation of Diagnostic Tests for Rotator Cuff Lesions. And this webcast will be presented twice on November 28th by a PhD candidate, Johanna Mensa from the University of Bern in Switzerland. And the registration for this webcast is open already on our website, but I will also send you an email invitation to those of you who are signed up for our newsletter. And last but not least, if you have any questions or you want to meet up with us, then please feel free to send us an email at sales at anybodytech.com. We also have an option to get a trial version of our software, and please feel free to, to email us to get a, a version of that. And if you have any follow-up questions regarding this webcast or any of the previous ones, then please feel free to reach out to me directly at ki at anybodytech.com. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention so far, and then it's time for some questions.